Here you go. I'm going to leave this down here. Hey! Hello. These people are showing up. Yes. They're, everybody trinkles in because it's Jewish time. Yep. Uh, Jewish time? JST. You know what Jewish time means. Jewish standard time. Plus or minus 30 minutes. <laughs> Usually minus the, or no, I never yeah, heard plus 30 one. minutes. Okay. I need a copy as well. Here. You have a copy. This is all the That's same. The this, same? Is, this is in that okay. book. This is just copy. Sometimes it's good to have because this book, I noticed, sometimes people's minds work differently. Yeah, as you'll see this book, <laughs> this book here. It's the same as this. Yes, yeah, it's the same. It's all the same. But the problem is to have a straight translation sometimes because you want to get the flow of the text mm -hmm. because the way that he um, puts his notes in, it's like choppy. It's like he'll bring a line of Tanya and then he'll explain a paragraph and then you go to the next line of Tanya and you'll forget where you were on the previous line. Right? So, uh, you know, sometimes people... But we're going to, so, so it helps sometimes to get a little bit of a flow, and then we'll go back into the commentary, okay? All right, so welcome to this class. We're on Starting Tanya, and we're going to be using this book called The Practical Tanya, because we want to make sure we bring it down, okay, into what we can do. And this is the second section. The second section actually had the classic name that he calls it because of an introduction that we're not going to do. He calls it Chinuch Katan, right? Chinuch Katan, which means... Little education. Little education. <laughs> <laughs> or the, the Chanuch Lanar Lafig Darko, right? Which is basically, Katan is like the small education of a child, okay? It's really important, the child, education of a child, Okay. And because he starts, of course, from this line from King Solomon that you have to educate a child according to his way, of course, we have to look at ourselves in terms of our way and how are we going to go ahead and make that relationship with God. Uh, it is Elul. Thank God. Yep. We're heading towards Rosh Hashanah. I had a fantastic insight yesterday about people that we always are taught that we have to prepare for Rosh Hashanah way before, like today. It's Rosh Chodesh El, it's the beginning. Today. You have to start today. What do you start to prepare for? And most people, when they think about Rosh Hashanah, who have been indoctrinated into the religious system, are usually terrified because it's called Judgment Day, right? It's like court case. <laughs> that doesn't sound good, right? How could you be excited about that, right? Meanwhile, on Rosh Hashanah, we wear nice clothes, we eat good foods because we're confident. We're confident that God is going to uh, be good to us. He'll enact decrees that are in harmony, something that we can handle, whatever it is. He will be compassionate upon us. We're confident. So, and it occurred to me, the idea really to work on in Russia in, as preparation is this one thought and this big idea. The biggest idea is, how much does God love us? Or me, if you have to say that. Think about it. Contemplate it. Do you really believe it? How much do you believe it? So every single day you have to work on trying to integrate to a greater, 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 greater degree how much God loves us, how much God loves me. He's crazy about us. He's crazy about me. And then what we're judged on in Rosh Hashanah is how well did you integrate that thought? That's how, how well did you do? How far did you go? Did it get a little bit more than last year? Are you still doubting? the relationship, okay? Shouldn't be any doubts in the relationship. In any case, the idea really, which is in tune with this idea here is, is the introduction is basically telling us that there's two types of love because we have a commandment to love God. Good morning. Good morning. We have a commandment to love God. And the question is, they all ask, all the commentaries is, how does, how does God command us how do you command to love, right? Love me, damn it, right? That's not going to work. Doesn't work yeah. It doesn't work. Oh, I'm okay. Pointed to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I could do anything, right? <laughs> so it doesn't. So what does that mean? A command, you know, a, 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 or even if you want to translate mitzvah the way I translate it, advice, okay? I advise you to love me. It's like, come on, right? A mitzvah, command, love, advice, whatever. 
So, of course, there's the automatic love, which the tzaddikim seem to hold. It comes automatically. This connection is sometimes so deep that their souls fly out of their bodies if they don't do something drastic. But then there's the rest of us. The rest of us have to awaken and use thoughts, books, inspiration to awaken us to come to a love of God. That's the whole point of emuna and bitachon, which is why this book starts with, uh, it's also called, the other uh, name is Gateway to Unity and Faith. So in order to come to that love of God, so as he says here just on page, here just on the end of this, in this book here, This title, Sha'ar Hayahud, is right? 17. That's what you want. No, here. Okay. If you look at page 15 there, the practical techniques for awakening love and reverence of God have already been detailed in the first book of Tanya. These techniques rely on contemplating God's greatness. So as a foundation to this work, we need to develop a more nuanced understanding of what it means that we believe God is one. So this is an exploration into thinking or contemplating, deepening our understanding of what does it mean that God is one. When we say, Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad, what does that mean? Right? And why we believe He is non-dual, that all existence is part of Him. It is to this that the second book of Tanya, Shar Yichud Vemuna, is devoted, in order to awaken this type of love. Okay? So here we go without any delays, because I always like to dive in, right? I know some rabbis, they'll do ten classes of introduction and never get to the... So I just like, this no lesson, we'll dive in, we'll figure it out. Everybody got a sheet here, doctor, in case you don't have a book. Okay. So, he brings down with something from Tikkune Zohar, that it says, actually from the Sefer Zohar, okay, Yeah, from the Sefer Zohar, he brings down this statement here. Lahavin me'at mize'er. We're going to understand a little bit. Mashikatu b'Zohar, what that is written in the Zohar. Here I'm on page 17 for those people. And here you can see, let us understand at least a small measure there, and on the, on the English. A minimal understanding of what the Zohar states, that Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad, Hero Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one, God is our God, and God is one, that's how he translated. That's called upper unification. Yichud Ila'a. Yichud Ila'a, and what does a unification mean? You have to think about that. Okay, a connection. We'll call it connection. There's upper connection. When we say Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad, that's called the upper connection. And when we say, Baruch Shem Kavod Malchus Le'olam Vo'ed, blessed be the name of His glorious kingdom forever and ever, that's called lower unification. End of statement of the Zohar. Exactly. Like, oh, hello. What does that mean? Okay? In other words, what are we supposed to be contemplating when we say the Shema? There's lots of things to contemplate. I'm not going to give it to you now. Okay? In terms of the Shema and what we're supposed to be contemplating, we're going to understand how he is viewing it for now, okay, before we go into the others. The Torah requires us to, to recite the Shema twice a day, to accept what we call the yoke of the kingdom of heaven, okay? Interesting thing, why we have to really contemplate what does that mean to accept upon ourselves the yoke of the kingdom of heaven, what does that mean at all, okay? So, yoke really is classically understood by many as what an uh, ox puts on himself, what we put on an ox, he doesn't put it on himself, because actually you don't want to, okay? The, uh, we put on the ox in order for the ox to plow the field. If the ox would not put on that yoke, you would not have a plowed field, you would not have anything growing in your field. I just have a hand down. Thank you. Okay. So yoke is another term, actually, that I saw in an, a book that I, my father-in-law would not let me hold on to. It was a book of yoga. Yoga means yoke. Really? Not yoke and the egg. Okay, yoke, which means basically 
connection. Okay? Mm. Now, interestingly enough, when you think of yoke and you think connection and you think of the what the ox will plow, then you can understand that this thing that the ox wears, that he connects to, is something that enables the ox to manifest something in the world, to bring out an expression. If Without that yoke, he would not be able to manifest or bring out or facilitate a growth. We are very much the same. We have to dive into the oneness of God twice a day in order to be a vehicle for God's expression in this world. You can't do it without. It won't happen without. It's like the ox with the yoke. So yoke, you can go, oh, yoke of the kingdom of heaven, what does that mean? So we're saying, for one, we're getting an idea of connection. Connection to the oneness. When you connect to the oneness, your reality changes, okay? The basic intention of the Shema is as required by Jewish laws to declare God as the king in the heavens and the earth. That's what really we're supposed to be thinking about. In other words, that he rules everything in your life. And you need this in the morning, and you need to go over it in the evening. Because why? Because we forget. We get caught. We get caught away. Hey, and if you want to sing Shema all day long, that's fine too, Right? Okay, there's songs that people would sing it, you know, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. People would sing that all day long because they have to keep hooking up into God is all there is. And he was running absolutely every single thing. Everything. Everything. But according to the Kabbalah, the Shema, we affirm not only God's unity in the world, but also, this is an interesting thing that he gets into, that I have never seen before, but also a unity within God. There's what's called a unity within God, and then there's going to be the, ex- the unity external of God, I'm assuming, which is kind of strange how we're going to understand this. A unity within God. Hmm. What is, how do you understand that? What is that talking about? In the first verse of the Shema, we affirm that God's power, which may seem to be diverse, since sometimes he rewards, sometimes he punishments, are in fact one. And this is what the Zohar calls upper unification. Okay? In other words, we see how God manifests himself in the world. Sometimes it comes out as judgment. Sometimes it comes out as mm-hmm. kindness. We see different expressions in the world. What's that hurricane coming in Florida now? What's its name? Dorian. 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 Pretty bad. Okay. So, you know, this is a manifestation. You never know. The wind can blow and it can end up dissipating, God willing. Okay? Um, But we see how God is sometimes like this and sometimes like that, and it seems like, well, what's going on? So it's diverse powers. Do you know we use the name for God classically as Elohim? Elohim. I say Elohim. Because it's the same word, actually, that is used when we want to say another God. We say, Elohim Acherim. But when we say Elohim, Elohim literally is plural. Isn't it right in grammar? So really, how can it be the word for God if it's a plural term? Okay? Interesting. All aspects of God. Aha, uh-huh, exactly. It is one. Meaning all the things that you see expressed in the world, whether it's a judgment or compassion or kindness or this... It's all coming from one source. That's called Yichud Ilah. After saying the six words of Deuteronomy, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one, before continuing with Deuteronomy, the same passage, which basically says, You shall love Hashem your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your money. <coughs> okay? So we say, Baruch Shem Kavod Malchut Sol Voed. We say it softly, except for Yom Kippur. No, I'm reading in, the, in this book. Oh, okay. 17. <laughs> it's okay. This six-word formula says the Zohar ex- represents what we call the six directions or energies of the created worlds that received energy from God's attributes. We should have this intention when saying the phrase, and it is referred to as lower unification. Basically, I didn't understand a thing that he said here. Okay? 
I will understand. I will do this. That it's brought down in many of the books of the Kabbalah. That he, actually, when a person says Shema Yisrael Hashem Elchino Shem Echad, there is a certain practice that people will move their head in four directions, very slightly, representing that God, the Dalit, is four. The numerical value of Dalit is four, which means that God runs all four directions. Really, now he's saying six directions goes up and down. Okay, and the Chabad skirts sing up, left, right, all around. Right? They sing a song about God is everywhere. Right? So, in it's six directions. All four directions, up and down. Lulav. Lulav, definitely. Very powerful. Okay? We're going to understand more of this. Upper unification, lower. He's got it not to even, of course, this is what he's going to ask here. Okay, here, look at this. This is an interesting reading there on a little paragraph on 18. The Tanya, however, will offer a deeper reading of these Zoharic terms, but... First, we need to immerse ourselves in the Baal Shem Tov's view of the universe, which radically redefined the monotheistic idea. So here we're going to come into, he's going to, of course, going to, we're going to understand this upper unity and lower unity, chapter 8, of course, that's how they do it. Every Jew, when you ask a question, they answer with another question, right? So this one's got another question that lasts eight chapters, okay? And then we get, to, you need it, you need the, you need the introduction, okay? It's all about you got to get square one, two, three, and then everything falls into place. But so far right now, you've been introduced to something called a Yichud Ilah, upper connection, and Yichud Tata, lower connection. That's how we're going to look at it. But of course, he's going to now take us to another place. Okay? And it brings down here. You see it in your sheets here. Know this day and take it to your heart that Havaya is Elohim. God is the Lord in the heavens above and upon the earth below. You got it? There is no other. We say it every single day in Aleinu. Ain'od. Ain od, ain od, ain od mil hado. It's the most deepest concept ever. And every single thing that we do in all of our workings in Torah and mitzvot is to get to the level of consciousness of ain od mil vado. Everything is getting to that. Okay? Now the question is, if you look at this verse here, he asks a question. This verse, this requires explanation, he says. For would it occur to you that there is a God dwelling in the waters beneath the earth that's necessary to negate it so strongly as to say, hey man, you got to get this, integrate this real deep in your heart, man. You see those slimy down there? There's no God down there. Just make sure you get that. Like, you got to have this memo on your forehead, okay? That slimy rock down there at the bottom, there's nothing down there except me, okay? Well, I wouldn't think. Why would I? I would... I, I would think that there's a some other force, right? That Hashem has to say, you got to let this sit on your heart. To that degree, this is what he's asking here, okay? So here, I'm going to go back here into the perush, right, of the, we'll call him the um, Rabbi Miller, okay? The simple statement that God is one is in fact surprisingly complex. Classically, it has been interpreted to mean that God is the one and only real deity. All other gods are false. Okay, that's classically how, what we under, how we understand it, that we don't go after other gods. The Kabbalists, however, were focused on a different concern when discussing the oneness of God, namely the unity within God. While God interacts with the universe through his different attributes or powers. We must be careful not to give these powers a separate identity from God. They are, in fact, merged with Him in a totally seamless unity, something that is beyond our full comprehension. Many Kabbalistic texts have been devoted to this theme, and it will be the concern of the present work, Part 2 of the Tanya, this book here. It's called Part 2, especially from Chapter 8 onwards. Here, in the first part of our book, the Tanya will elaborate upon another dimension of the God is one idea. It is a theme which became a cornerstone of the Hasidic revolution of the Baal Shem Tov, though it can be traced to earlier Jewish sources, namely that 
God is the only true existence. In other words, what we're, what's going on now ain't real. What's the real true existence? That is not to say that, God, that the world does not exist at all. <clears throat> Rather, the world's existence is contingent on God, and therefore it has no independent existence. Rabbi Nachman goes into this, uh, that there's something called a mechuyav metziyut, which is obligatory existence versus possible existence. Now, only God is obligatory existence, absolute existence. He must exist. He exists absolutely. Creation, on the other hand, is only possible existence. doesn't have to, right? And we know that all of the, what do you call it, the quantum physicists, right, all get into everything is based upon probability aptitudes. It's, the table will probably be here in a minute in another second. We probably exist. Probability aptitudes, they call it. Okay? Possible. Okay? And the idea here is to deepen this. Oh, to deepen it so much. Okay, so we have this phrase, and you shall know this day and take it to your, upon your heart, and we've already just asked the question. Okay? Now, just to go weiter here. Okay, so now we're going to go into the Baal Shem Tov's idea concept. It is written... Forever your God, your word, stands firm in the heavens. Le'olam Hashem devar chanitzav b'shamayim. Actually, that's a phrase from the book of Psalms. Le'olam Hashem devar chanitzav b'shamayim. By the way, these phrases you say on Yom Kippur, when? On Yom Kippur. Does anybody know? You, at, at the end of Yom Kippur, the last thing, the last things we say on Yom Kippur, Okay, I forgot what the um, Sephardic do. It's kind of a little twang on it. But everybody's in front of the Arna Kodesh. The Arna Kodesh is open, right? And before they blow the shofar, or is it after they blow the shofar? I think it's before they blow the shofar, right? Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. They say once. Baruch Shem. Three times. And then Hashem Hu Elokeim. Seven times. Right? The most powerful things. That's the most powerful time ever to instill, to integrate these concepts, okay? So everything that we're starting now is going to work to that moment at Yom Kippur when you guys are all standing there and now's the time, okay? So forever, O oh God, your word stands firm in the heavens and actually they say this. I think the Svartim say this. The Svartim say this. Ashkenaz don't say this. They say, I think they say this like, I don't know how many times, but a lot. The Baal Shem Tov of Blessed Memory has explained that your word, this is so dynamic, it's so mind-blowing, okay? Your word, which you uttered, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. These very words and letters stand firmly forever within the firmament of heaven and are forever clothed within all the heavens to give them life. As it is written, the word of our God shall stand firm forever. And, also another verse, his words live and stand firm forever. Okay? So, here's case in point. God made ten utterances in creation. If you look in the very first chapter of Genesis, it says ten times, and God said, let there be light, and God said, let there be a firmament. It's not like the way we say, we say statements. We say something and walk away. Okay? God's statement is still being said now because he's eternal. The Torah is eternal. And those statements give every single thing its animation constantly. When God said, let there be a man, every single, every single person comes from that statement. It is the inner vitality of every single thing in the physical world, in the creation that we are exp experiencing. It is the inner soul, okay, is the ten statements of creation. They are giving every single thing its existence. So that's what it means by forever, O oh God, your word stands firm in the heavens. They're meaning they're still being said now and they're giving every single thing its vitality. <laughs> For if the letters were to depart... Even for an instant, God forbid, and return to their source, all the heavens would become naught and absolute nothingness, and it would be as though 
they had never existed at all. As exactly as before the utterance, let there be a firmament. Okay? If he would retract, boom, it doesn't exist anymore and it never did exist. He is constantly willing every single thing into creation. Once I had this rabbi bring me and my friend into an office. Okay? And he brought us in, sat us down, closed the door. I thought it was going to get some really, you know. And it was pretty cool what he said. And he says, you have to realize we're all living in God's dream. Right now. God is dreaming us, our existence. You got a question there? The way you're saying it now makes it sound really spooky, but if you think of us as a computer game, you can turn off the game. <laughs> I think computer games were just invented just to give us this kind of idea here. It's very sophisticated and very real. Because <laughs> one guy I remember once in a class, my father-in-law was there going, everything's an illusion, man. My father-in-law, Psh, how's that feel? <laughs> That's an illusion. Okay. <laughs> it's an illusion that has meaning. Okay, it is. But in a certain okay. sense... We're trying, and every single thing, okay, is about peeling off the mask of matter, okay? It's about seeing deeper into things, to attune ourselves and train ourselves. Because it's not going to be the strong survive, right? I don't think it's going to be the smart survive either, because people cannot smart themselves out of, right out of faith in God, as I've seen. It's going to be the spiritual survive. In other words, if you're not able to jump beyond this physical realm in your mind to a certain degree, when all of the mountain, all the mountains will melt like wax, where will you be? Are you going to be freaking out or going, okay, this is cool, okay? Under the wax. <laughs> what? I got wax on my feet. Okay, if the letters were to part, even for an instant, okay, we read that. And so it is with all created things. In all the upper and lower worlds, e and even this physical earth, which is the kingdom of the silent, we'll call it the inanimate, the minerals, earth. If the letters of the ten utterances by which the earth was created during the six days of creation were to depart from it, but for an instant, God forbid, it would revert to naught and absolute nothingness exactly as it did before the six days of creation. So here, look at the uh, page 21. We're just going to go a little back here on page 21 of the note here, okay? Because it's very important to get this, okay? Normally, we look at language as a convention to describe something which is real and actual. For example, a chair exists regardless of what we call it. The word chair is merely a label that we agree upon so that this piece of furniture can be identified. But here, the Tanya invites us to re-envision the relationship between language and reality. The universe, we are told, only exists by virtue of language, which means the language is reality and existence is convention. How bizarre, okay? Language is reality, and existence is just a convention. It's the opposite. In other words, we think the chair is just there, and we just label it as a chair, but he's saying, no, 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 really. The language is giving it existence. The fact that it's there is just a convention. <laughs> the words with which God creates the universe are not incidental or a mere label of convenience. They are the energy of the universe, the very power which endows us with existence. The letters are more real than the universe itself. The universe only happens to exist because God has uttered a particular string of words and letters. Interesting how he says string. Okay? Oh. The super string. The super string theory. You know, those strings that they believe are in the subatomic particles. That's the theory these days. Are really tight strings. Like, you couldn't. Right? Oh, they can be. They can be. Okay? The strings are vibrations, right? Letters are vibrations. Letters are energies. I call them the primordial energy fields of creation because they are energies. 
And if you do them in the right order, you can manifest things. That's why we pray all day. Rabbi Nachman's, what is how his, his modus operandus, if you call it like that, is pray, learn, pray. Those are the only things you should be involved with. Okay? Pray, study, pray. Okay? Okay, you might have to do this and this and this, but in between and every single moment you can. Okay? So here, now going back here. Um, here, so go to the other page here. This is thought. Here, I'm on the second side of this page. The same thought was expressed by the Ari of blessed memory when he said that even in completely inanimate matters such as stones or earth or water, there is a soul and a spiritual life force. This is what we've actually been learning in, Shar, in, the, in the gates of reincarnation. Not every stone is a reincarnated soul, but nevertheless, there is some kind of life force, a spiritual life force within a stone. Actually, we have that from... Genesis. Yaakov Avinu, Jacob our father, when he went and lied down, so he put a bunch of stones mm -hmm. around him, right? Mm -hmm. For a, a pillow. I, I can't see it's a pillow. I think it was more of a protection kind of thing, right? Just just, just kind of like his, his, his effort to, uh, you know, just so the animals wouldn't grab him. Head on the stone. Yeah, exactly. He did. It's true, but it's kind of like, have you ever used a stone for a pillow? <laughs> Not Gee, okay, it's like you got any, you know, I mean, get a bush or something, or you know, I don't know, you know, I've had a stone for a, a pillow, a, underneath the pillow even, and it was not good, okay, so in any case, all of the stones on the next morning, which were multiple stones, and the next morning they were one, one stone. stone, the verse says it, and he took the stone, and he, what happened, there were multiple stones, now it's one stone's so everybody knows that Rashi brings down from this Midrash that all the stones were having this huge debate, right? Going, I want the tzaddik to put, the righteous person to put his head on me. And they went, no, I me. Yeah, I want me, I want me. Right, all the little munchkins were just catching. So Hashem blew the whistle and go, okay, well, you're all one stone now. You happy now? Okay, I'm happy now. Okay, <coughs> it's all smushed together. Okay, one stone. Okay, so in any case, the stones had some kind of element within them that wanted to be elevated. Okay? So that is enclosed the enclothing of the letters of speech of the ten utterances which give life and existence to inanimate matter that it might arise out of the naught and nothingness which preceded the six days of creation. Okay? So the letters we say are <coughs> primordial energy fields of creation and they're still giving every single thing its inner vitality. That's right. It's the matrix. Okay? This is why people got, all the Jews got so excited. Letters! Yeah! That's it. It's right here. It's in this book. Okay? That inside everything, as we know that the Lubavitcher Rebbe, the, 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 early, the one who wrote this book, the author of this book, before he passed away, he was on the bed, he was looking on the ceiling and he's going saying to his students, Look! I see the letters. Which means beam. I saw the beams. No, it's not a beam. He saw the inner vitality of these letters. Now, letters are very powerful. If we, but we have to understand first just to understand that they're there. Okay? And they are energies. And then when we say, and it's always the Hebrew language, because it's the Hebrew. That's why it's not, the Hebrew is not like any other language. Okay? Because it was used to infuse, and it constantly infuses everything within creation. Okay? It's hard for us to go ahead and see it. Okay. Okay, we're waiting for the red pill. Okay? The, you know, this is kind of a red pill. You know, the red pill here is not just a pill and I wake up. You know, it's like you have to work on it. We're all like, in a certain sense, we're all, uh, we're butterflies in a, what do you call it, a chrysalis? Uh, not a cocoon. Okay? Cocoons mm -hmm. are for moths. We hope not to wake up and be a moth, right? Moth, moth. Okay. <laughs> we hope not to, okay? But they do see the light. <laughs> but, you know, we have to, we are, in, we are in this encasing. We are in a process of becoming vessels for the infinite light. But we, part of the process is, we got to break out ourselves, Right? you're walking and you see a moth trying to break out of the cocoon and you help it, it will never fly. 
because it needs that mm, to develop to develop the muscles in order to give it the ability. We need it. We need all of the situations in our lives. We need them. You need this. Okay, we never would look at it like that, but kind of like you got to try to flip that around. God loves us incredibly, and he wants us to grow, but we got to do it ourselves. And so when we have the opportunity, we should thank God for the opportunity to do it ourselves. Okay, that means have amuna, develop the amuna, and develop the bitachon. Okay? On top of everything is the letters. Okay, so I look at this. Thank God, I, you know, I, I don't usually carry these with you, but this is pretty cool. Okay? I have here tuning forks, right? These are really cool, right? Everybody loves my tuning forks, okay? So I have here an A, and if I strike it, it makes an A vibration. Can you hear it? Maybe back there, it's a little hard. If I take an A to it, actually it keeps on going, right? If I take an A and touch another A, it keeps on going. Very subtle here, but it, this also keeps vibrating. If I take, let's say, strike an A, Touch an E to it, what happens? It cancels. It cancels out. An A only knows how to affect or be affected by another A. An A does not know how to affect or be affected by an E. Different vibration, different vibe, man. Okay? <laughs> Dude, okay? It's like, is he on my vibe or is he not on my vibe? Okay? What is my vibe? Okay? The letters are vibrations. If you have the right vibrations in the right sequence and the right connection to them with the right understanding, it's unbelievable the power of those letters. Moses did not kill Vincent Price by strangling him. Sorry, Charlton Heston, right? He did not, the guy, he killed him with a name of God. He said the letters and, the, and, and that killed him. A name of God is a series of letters that has a manifestation to it, an expression. So, those and Ella Fitzgerald, they did that. I saw it. I saw it on um, Mythbusters. I saw it on Mythbusters. I never watched Mythbusters. I happened oh, off the myths. backhand, you know, I don't know where I was, in an airport or something. And they tested if a person's vibration can break a glass. Can it reel? I think they didn't get Ella Fitzgerald. I don't know if she's alive. Is she alive? Okay. Any case... They got a, they got a, first they did a speaker and it did break the glass and then they got a real rock star, right? <sighs> a real rock star a real, with a guy with a good voice and it took him hours, but he finally did it. With a vibration, he broke a glass. It can be done. It can affect things. And that's on a ex very extreme level. But let's talk about us on a subtle level, okay? Because the letters are very, very powerful. So... And to the and now so and they, and they have all everything has a vibration to it, okay. Just to digress, just a little bit, we have some time. She okay? died in 1996. This, uh, Thank you. Keep Good up, to know. Keep okay. you posted. Okay. It's a little late. I have more information. All right. 23 ago. Okay. Now, although the name Evan Stone, we're gonna keep going here. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now, although the name Evan Stone is not mentioned in the Ted utterances in the Torah, that's the question, right? Hey, Rabbi, right here. Now, although. Okay. You know, you're saying every single thing comes from those ten utterances of creation. Wait a minute, rock is not in, I don't see it. God did not say, let there be a rock. Right? Where does that come from? How does that manifest? How does that work? Okay. Nevertheless, life force flows to the stone through combinations and substitutions of the letters which are transposed in the 231 gates. What does that mean, Rabbi? Either in direct or reverse order, as explained in the Sefer Yetzirah, which we're going to get into, which is my Wednesday night class. Here's your commercial station identification, commercial a torch at 7 o'clock on Wednesday nights, we start Sefer Yitzira this coming Wednesday. We started actually a little bit of the introduction, but now we're going to begin this coming Wednesday. You can tune in if you can't make it. You can always catch me on Facebook or torch uh, videos. So in other words, sometimes letters can be substituted because they sound the same, like a kuf and a chaf. Sometimes letters can be substituted because of numerical 
situations. There's many, many, many different ways that they substitute letters and do kind of, I hate to say the word, tricks, okay? But there's many ways that letters through numerical values, substitutions of letters because they sound the same, right? And there's different other traditions that we have how letters could be substituted and things like that. There's different situations where you can make other letters from letters, okay? Let's say like, um, look at just the letter Aleph. Let's look at the letter Aleph. Okay, do I have a pen? Yeah. Thank you. Let's look at the letter Aleph. Okay. No, they're all written. I don't have a blank sheet. Okay, fine. So if I look at the letter Aleph, we'll just use this. If I spell out the letter Aleph, like this, Aleph, Lamed, Pei, that spells the letter Aleph. Right? So from the letter Aleph, which is just one little letter, I spell it out. And from this, I can get other letters from it. From X, for example, the word Aleph itself, if I spell it out. And then if I spell out Lamed, the letter Lamed, like this, going like this, Lamed, Mem, Dalet. I've got other letters. And then from Pei, I get Pei, Hey. So you see, from this one letter, Aleph, I spell out the word, and then from here, I spell out each letter, and then you can spell out those letters, then you can spell out those letters, and spell out those letters, basically you can get there. Almost every letter except for, uh, I can't remember, okay? <laughs> mem, mem, you can't do it, because mem is mem, mem. <laughs> it's always mem, right? So, but in any case, you see, I'm just trying to show you one example of how letters can express or bleed out into other letters. Transposing letters, combinations of letters. So that, that, the ten utterances of creation, basically through combinations, gematria, substitutions of letters, like that, can actually cause to manifest the stone. Later on he gets into the exact detail of how that works. How, it, how from this statement you get to stone, or rock, Evan. Okay? What is the 231 gates? Now, mostly in modern Hebrew, we have shurashim roots. Words have always, in our tradition, a three-letter root. Okay? The Kabbalistic or the Sefer Yetzirah says there's two-letter roots. Really, there's three, but there's two really main ones that really make everything its existence. If I take every letter, how many letters are? 22. Mm -hmm. Right? And I times each letter by, like if I combine, I hook up an olive with a bait, olive with a gimel, olive with a dalit, and I go like that with every single letter, right? So really we're looking at 21 times 22, which basically equals 462. Wow. Okay, but, but, but that's going forward and backward. If I only want to go one way, olive to bait, olive to gimel, and do that, basically it ends up being 231. Because you wanted, I just want to let you know where do you get that number two hundred thirty-one. Basically, it's a type of how many times you can combine the letter alphabet, the olive bait, one way. Okay, two hundred and thirty-one. They're called the two hundred thirty-one gates because those two letter combinations are the dynamic gates which everything is created. Okay, we'll get to this later on when we go ahead and do our class project and make a golem. Okay. Whoa. Class project. All right. We're going to go back of Joe V's and make a goal. Okay. I think I should sit further away. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have the goal pretty happening. close to me. You know, I could see, I, I, I see you, Howard. You know, you go, how's this? How's this? I'm like, that sucks. That's a little horse, like this big. You make a little horse this big. Okay. <laughs> You call that a golem, right? Yeah, that looking kind of skinny. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> so for that little diversion, okay. 231 gates, either in direct or reverse order, as explained in Sefer Yasir, until the combination of the name descends from the ten utterances and derived from them. And this is the life force of the stone. In other words, the stone has a life force to it. It's a combination of letters. It's Aleph, Vet, Nun. Aleph, Bet, Nun. Evan. 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 And so it is with all created things in the world. Their names in the holy tongue 
are the very letters of speech which descend degree by degree from the ten utterances recorded in the Torah by means of substitutions and transpositions of the letters through the 231 gates, all the combinations, until they reach and become invested in that particular created thing to give it life. Okay? This descent is necessary. Why? Because individual creatures are not capable of receiving their life force directly from the ten utterances of the Torah. It's too powerful. For the life force issuing directly from them is far greater than the capacity of the individual creatures. In other words, when in, in terms of God's utterances, let there be a firmament, let there be light, right? Let there be man. The exact direct utterances are too great. It's too much of an influx. It's nuclear power. And you, my friend, are a blow dryer. Do not plug in to the nuclear power plant with a blow dryer. Okay? Bzz. Okay? So the idea is it has to be filtered. It needs to be transformed. It needs, got to dilute it a little bit to where that life, that entity, is able to go ahead and receive its life force and not be overwhelmed by it. They can receive the life force only when it descends and it is progressively diminished, degree by degree, by means of substitutions and transpositions of the letters and by gematriot, their numerical values, until the life force can be condensed and enclosed and there can be brought forth from it a particular creature. And the name by which it is called in the holy tongue is a vessel for the life force condensed into the letters of that name which has descended from the ten utterances of the Torah that have power and vitality to create being something from nothing, that's what ex nihilo means, and give it life forever. For the Torah and the Holy One, blessed be He, are one. This is an interesting dynamic. Okay? We always look at the Torah as the blueprint of creation. That God looked into the Torah and created the world. Now the interesting thing is, when you think about it, okay, okay, great, I got it. The Torah is a blueprint, cool, okay. Just like the person builds a building, they have a blueprint for it. It's not really exactly like that. But the idea here is two ideas you have to really get from this. One, in order to make the blueprint, the Torah, what did you need? Letters. Letters were the first thing made. The Torah wasn't made. The, the letters had to be made before the Torah. They're pre-blueprint. Primordial energy fields. Okay, the building blocks of creation are those letters. Very dynamic. Different way to connect, and we're going to get into this when we get into some meditations. The Baal, specifically the Baal Shem Tov technique of tefillah, prayer. But the idea here is that the bloop or the letters, God had to create first, and then make the Torah, and then creation. And we always look at the Torah as the blueprint of creation, but not in the classic way that once the building is made, you put away the blueprint. It's made in a way that it's still existing, very much like how Rabbi Kiva Tatz put it, a projector, the film, and the screen. You always got to view it like this. You can't do it enough. The film projector just shines a light, and then there's the film in front of the projector, and then there's the screen that it's being projected in. The, the light is the light of God. The film is the Torah itself. Those letters, and the screen is the world. That's why every single thing that we experience, we want to always hook it up to where is it in the Torah. Haman from a Torah, Haman min a Torah min mi'ayin. Where is Haman in the Torah? And they find it. He's in the very beginning of creation in the Garden of Eden. Okay, where is this in the Torah? Where is this in the Torah? There was one rabbi, if you'd say a word, he would go, where is that in the Torah? And he'd find it, and, he, and if, or if he wouldn't find it, then he'd like, like that, right? I used once the, the, the word I was telling somebody from that school, I'm going, yeah, I'm starting a new class, adventures and awareness. Adventure, adventure, there's no such word like that in the Torah. Therefore, all right, like that. I'm like, you just popped my bubble, man. I was like excited about that title, right? In any case... Every single thing is in the Torah. It's constantly the Torah, and we are in it. We're part of the light, we're in the film, and we're in the screen, by the way. We're strung through all three. Okay? Our job is to connect them. Okay? Connect to the light of God, 
through the Torah and onto this world. Okay? But the idea is that every single thing in this creation is being reflected from the letters in the Torah. Kind of bizarre, isn't it? We're kind of trying to shake your world a little bit. You have to start to develop a relationship with the letters. Okay? And the dynamic way that we're going to do now before I end, because i got to end early because i got to bring my daughter to the airport, is the Baal Shem Tov, once he, actually we had a verse a few uh, weeks ago, where it says, not by bread alone does man live, but only by that which comes out of the mouth of God does man live. Mm-hmm. Classic verse. So he asked some questions there, not by bread alone does man live, only by what comes out of the mouth of God does man live. And he explains here, he brings from the Arizal, that people were trying to understand what feeds the soul, what is the nourishment of the soul. He says, kind of, if you think of the soul, the soul is completely not connected to any physicality whatsoever. So it shouldn't need any bread and water, right? Yet, on the other side of the coin, if you think about it, if a person doesn't eat for an extended period of time, the soul leaves the body. The person dies. If he doesn't eat and drink, what happens? The soul leaves the body. Why should that be so? Why should it be, if the soul is so spiritual and shouldn't be connected to anything physical, how come that if the body of the person would not eat, the soul would leave? So, of course, the Arizal says these people are stupid, okay, because they don't understand how creation works. And basically, as very much in the same exact way we're understanding here, is that because there is vitality of the letters in every single thing in creation, and when a person, so when a person makes a blessing on a fruit, okay, when a person makes a blessing on a fruit and he says, Baruch atah Hashem, okay, what's he doing? His letters are making a vibration. And what happens when he says that, the things which are in vibration, which are in the same harmony, also start to vibrate. In other words, you say, Baruch atah Hashem, Elokeinu Melech Olam, Borei Priya Eitz, Blessed you Hashem, our God, who made this fruit, right? So you're uttering something, Instantly what happens is becomes awakened in the fruit, the spiritual letters, the vitality that is within that piece of creation, that fruit, for for our example. So it becomes awakened in there. And then when the person eats it, so then he actually takes in the vitality of that. Okay? So the idea here is for a practical reason, even though that we don't see the letters, we'd like to. But we have to know first that they are there. That's step one. Okay? That those letters are giving every single thing. And so then, at least when we make blessings over food, we are igniting the spiritual vitality in that food. And that gives the soul its energy. Now, the big question they always ask is, Ah, what about those people who never say blessings? Okay? So... Our rabbis of blessed memory refer to them as the walking dead. That's right. Zombies came way before the, wa- the what do you call it, the living dead, walking dead, whatever. Walking. George Romero. Okay. That was not Night of the Living Dead. That was the first one. First zombie movie. Okay. <laughs> so, any- <laughs> let's date ourselves, rabbi. Okay. So, the idea here is. That's right. You can have people who are walking and having existence, but are they alive? But what we want to do is we want to attach ourselves to the life force within everything. And it doesn't and it starts first with our thoughts. Okay? That's step one, and then we'll move God to Hashem next time. Oh, thank you. Questions. Is all, this, is all this information in here or not?